ever about that about that one uh, afternoon. And I wanted to start with that because when I think about what I want to do with fiction and what I want to do with my work, I'm not I'm not somebody who I don't consider myself a revolutionary at all. I don't consider myself somebody who is going to remake things. I, I'm not that good. I, 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 what I like to do is I like to revision things and, and remind people of the magic that they already have. You know, James had earlier talked about why I write about food. I write about food because whenever, you know, when you, when you go back, when I go back to Ithaca and I have that Nines pizza, don't tell me that's not magic. You know, there is so much magic in that we hold. And so when I think about work uh, that I want to do, I think about uh, my poetry and my fiction as catalysts to work with a reader to maybe remind them of the magic that they already possess. I'm going over things because nobody wants to hear a girl read for an hour from a novel, from a novel, you know, novel readings can be a little bit dense. So instead, what I wanted to offer to all of you is maybe just a little bit of a tour through some things I'd like to maybe, I want to read a short story, I want to read some poems, and then I want to add end with the novel, and then maybe open it up for some questions. And, you know, throughout the whole time, I want to stay close to all you, I don't want to like, stay behind the page and just read because you all honor me by being here and I want to soak all of this in. Okay, so um, let's go ahead. So um, anyway, what we're talking about this idea of seeing the seeing the magic in the world that's that's there you know my feeling is why can't there be a, a donut stargate when was the last time we made enough friends you know we made friends with somebody you know to the point where we got into their world and see their magic uh one of the coolest things that ever happened in los angeles uh for example was um i'm a martial artist and uh my friend who was a chiropractor of all things said yeah hey Rika I want to you know my 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 grandfather wants to show you something and I said sure this sounds cool there's probably you're you know it's like we're all Asian there's probably going to be good food involved so uh you know we I went to this sort of nondescript building literally in El Monte and uh we we go into the basement and there's this, this beautiful beautiful like martial arts uh, almost like a garden and you know he and he's showing me uh, he's showing me his style which is quite different from mine but it was fun to watch and he, he just wanted to share and I we would have never I would have never known that inside there was this like you might as well have been you could have been it you know you could have been in you know shoot except for the Chinese part, you could have been in Kyoto. Okay, it was just so beautiful. And, um, and because of that, you know, there are, I, I, you know, with, I believe that there might actually be somewhere a bunch of space aliens in a, in a donut shop in the back. And uh, nobody can take that belief away from me because I get to choose that. Anyway, so this is a story that I wanted to write. It's called A Different Way Home. And I think in some ways it, uh, I wasn't, I didn't even think about reading this except during the master class, we were talking and I thought this would be a fun story to, to read. And this is a little bit of, you know, kind of what I see as a writer and what I want to give to um, whoever encounters my work. A Different Way Home. This is published in Shark Reef. Uh, it was published a couple of years ago, maybe more than that, anyway. A Different Way Home. A long, long time ago, there was a little town. And in that little town, there was a family. And in that family, there was a girl. The girl was not the sort of girl whom you would have noticed. She was neither beautiful nor talented. She wasn't well-spoken, and she didn't wear fancy clothes or get the best grades in school. She did know people and would sometimes even have lunch with them, but she'd never been invited to anyone's house or a movie night or a 
birthday party or sleepover. Her mother asked, are you okay? Let us know if you're having problems. She would nod and say thank you, but she had no problems to speak of. Her father would ask if she were happy. She would nod and say, yes, I'm happy. But she said that mostly because it was what he wanted to hear. His parent, her parents would frown and wonder what else they could do. The girl knew they did not really believe her and she knew they were very worried. But she wasn't lying. You see, she really had nothing more to say. And each day after school, when everyone else was on their way home, so was she. Except where they had places to go, places to go, this girl took a different way home. Yes, she walked to the same streets, past the same stores, the same sandwich shops and nail salons and Chinese herb stores. She passed the woman selling cut fruit on the street by the mailbox, the supermarket where someone was roasting chestnuts and another feeding rows of chilled sugar cane through a roller with the fresh, refreshing juice dripping into styrofoam cups. There was the alley with cooks from the barbecue place taking their lunch break, the bookstore with CDs of music only her grandmother understood. And under the power lines, there was sidewalk and sidewalk and sidewalk and usually despite all the noise and activity around her and about her on that sidewalk it was quiet and still on this trip home however a group of little boys were making a commotion near the gutter they were shouting and poking at something she looked it was a turtle which had probably escaped from one of those little aquariums that the stores would sell this was a very warm day, however, and the gutter was almost completely dry. Without thought, she ran and chased the little boys away, and she picked up the turtle. It was warm to the touch, barely alive. She didn't know what to do, so she splashed it with some cool water from her bottle. The turtle was tiny, fitting in the palm of her hand. And it was green except for a bright red stripe along the sides of its head. It was small, but it was perfectly formed. She could make out its claws and saw how the different parts of its shell fit together. It seemed to revive a little, but it was very weak. She took it to the store that sold turtles, but they said they didn't want a sick turtle. She was walking on the sidewalk wondering how she would ask her parents to let her keep the turtle when she realized that the turtle had died in her hand. She stopped. For how long, she didn't know, but not far from her was a park, and when she began walking again, that was where she walked. She found a cool place under some shrubs and dug a small hole and buried the turtle there. She poured the rest of her water over it and placed a little red flower from a nearby bush on top. And then she walked home. She didn't tell anyone about this, not her parents, nor the people at school. But on her way home the next day and the day after, she would stop by. She would talk to that turtle. She didn't know why, but she could talk about the silliest things, how she really liked her new shoes, or how the new boba place had a nice lady and a mean lady, and this time it was the nice lady, and her taro boba was extra sweet. Then one day, she saw a girl about her age sitting next to where the turtle was. She was wearing a green dress, and there was a bright red barrette in her hair. Thank you, the turtle spirit said, for taking care of me. The girl nodded because who else could the figure in front of her be? Are you okay, the girl asked, sounding a bit like her mother. Oh, yes. I was only here for a little while. I was in this little tank and fell down and then was prodded by 
those boys. And if I had died that way, I might have become a vengeful ghost. But thanks to you, my last memories were good. I died while being held by someone who cared for me. And after that, you remembered. And now I can go on to the next land peacefully and without regret. The girl nodded and tried to smile. Part of her, though, was sad because once again, she'd have no one to talk to. Will you remember me? The turtle spirit tilted her head. Of course. I enjoyed listening to you all these days. I like your shoes, too. And I'll never forget you. I'll miss you, the girl finally said. The turtle spirit paused. If you want, I can introduce you to my friends. If you meet them, you won't need to feel alone. Are your friends like you? Hmm. For the most part, the turtle nodded. Some are booger heads, but I'll warn you about those. The turtle spirit paused. But if you meet them, I need to tell you, you will change. You won't notice, but others will. And they may treat you differently or maybe avoid you altogether. The girl nodded. It's OK. I want to meet your friends. Come here, the turtle spirit said. And please close your eyes. And when she did, the girl felt the turtle spirit kiss her on the forehead. You can open them now. And when she did, the world had come alive. They walked down the street, she and the turtle spirit. There's the girl who walks here every day. Hello, how are you? I feel like I know you. She can finally see us, wonderful. She met the flower spirit and the folding fan spirit the goldfish spirit and the alley cat spirit, the sandwich shop spirit and the bookstore spirit, the chestnut spirit and the mailbox spirit. And up overhead was the power line spirit. The sidewalk spirit asked her to shuffle her feet once in a while because he really liked his back scratched. Everywhere the girl looked, there seemed to be friends to be made. And by the time they finished the day, the turtle spirit told her to look up into the sky over the high buildings because there in the evening sky was the moon spirit. She's telling me it's time to go. The turtle spirit hugged the girl one last time then shifted to a glowing turtle and swam upwards into the sky. The girl waved and began to cry. But then the, the moon spirit smiled, and it was such a smile that said, yes, I know it hurts, but this is the sort of sadness that connects us, for this is the sadness of love. In the days that followed, the girl went on with her life as before, to be at home, to have supper, bathe, dry one's hair, and go to sleep. The next day, was like the day before and the day after, and each day after school, when everyone else was on their way home, so was she. But the turtle spirit had been right. For though the girl thought she was walking like before and speaking like before and acting like before, just as before, the people around her began to treat her differently and to whisper. Eventually, she was eating her school lunches alone. Are you okay, her mother asked. Are you happy, her father would ask. And she wanted to tell them about everything she had seen, of the way the sky spirit shone after the rain, how the sidewalk spirit sighed when scratched by her shuffling feet, the way the door hinge spirit in her homeroom would squeak good morning to her every day. But instead she nodded and said, yes, I'm happy. Her father told her mother, I don't know how, and this makes no sense, but this time I think she really means it. And I guess for right now, maybe that should be more than enough. Now, as you, get, you might have guessed, I lied a little when I said the story happened a long time ago and far away, because it might have happened not far from here, maybe even not far from you, not long ago, maybe even yesterday, who knows. But I do know 
that when one walks along in streets, one does not know all the spirits one passes by. In one's day to day, there is magic there and magical beings who walk through walls, glisten like rainbows and fly overhead like a helium balloon. And there are those who perhaps through a gift or chance or circumstance, acquire eyes and ears to see them. And they may get, they go their own way. They may stumble into things and occasionally look like they're speaking to the moon, but maybe one day, if you befriend them, walk with them home from school, listen to what they say and still invite them to your sleepover, maybe they might show you how to see their world too. A long, long time ago, there was a little girl in a little town. And in that family, she lived. So I hope you enjoy that. So that is, I wanted to share that. I wanted to, um, because I think as writers, as creators of stories, we shouldn't take all the credit for the creation, right? <laughs> so um, the next thing I want to do here is I wanted to read a little bit from Why Dust Shall Never Settle Upon the Soul. This is my book of poetry. And I'm going to read the first part. The reason I wanted to do this is I wanted, I, in the master class, excuse me, we had spoken about writers, uh, especially poets, as keepers of truth, keepers of uh, history and our ancestors and things like that. So um, I might read the first and we'll see how far I go. All right. So, but anyway, before I, before I get into this, does anybody want to say anything right now? Are there any, any questions or any comments before we move? We good? All right. I, might, I might just say that um, your story summoned my seven-year-old into the room who just sat here with me listening to it. And then he insisted on making the little heart reaction because he I really it. appreciated the heart. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my God. Well, that was from him. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, this one we're going to be talking. So this book happened after I lost two of my friends in the same year. Uh, they both uh, they both. Um, yeah, they're both really beautiful people, Alexis and Donna, and they're gone now. Um, so anyway, um, the woman of water dreams. Consider that for every rational number, there exists an array of values that do not resolve. The dead or frightened house cat, the slipshod dance of sun and moon, a Shanghai butterfly splits the baryons of a faraway nucleus. And you wonder why I like donuts? Against infinite babble, any rational value is nothing. So nothing makes sense. Terrifying now to consider this when so many of my friends had died. One morning, a gunman shot up our library, killed the groundskeeper who waved from the yellow electric car. For all he was, he will be forever known as the groundskeeper. His daughter was killed as well. For all she was, she will always be known as his daughter. What is true and proud? What survives the infinite crush of the hidden, transient, lost? The murderer sees you or no. The family accepts you or no. Your blood test comes back clean or no. Who pop and locked with the beautiful man? free falling past mornings after holding quilts and lovers and ashes. For what? A green light too early? A stutter step late? What is life well lived? Who fluffs a pillow through the luck of a silence phone? But that we meant more in being than being wherever we are. With another November, the names of trans people change color and fall. Mispronounced, seated, sainted to anonymous candles and anonymous flame. Someone will pledge money 
someone will start singing. Someone inspired will say, I think all hatred is bad. Why can't life just be good for everyone? Past each favorite cousin, each favorite movie, each crisp new resume, past each broken heel, fall, wax, and remembrance just for a moment still warm to the touch. She was fierce, they say, an angel on earth, enchanting. I smell carne asada, and I hear the number four bus, while the hole in my heart murmurs, yes, yes, yes. Stunted fathers, neglected boys, cocktails of hormones, and stress-altered wombs. Healing the village, speaking with the dead, dancing to the heavens for fortune and rain. Blessed goddesses, prophets, mermaids and rainbow flags and almost tenure track in the new queer studies department. Teeth kicked out, jawbones foot stomped into sidewalks. False lassage and fables entrance another's others ever after. Lace and delusion entangle the bedpost as I rattle my vanity for a foundation, for concealer, a face to a mispronounced name. She killed herself, the way queer folks do, writing of one-horned aliens and road rage unicorns. She killed herself, the way queer folks do, living as role model, inspiration to all but what love truly knows. Behind the fishing poles, there's a Coleman ice chest, a Lionel train, a tiny wooden stool with marks for Crayola and someone's baby teeth. I try to pray, yet thirst only for silence and for sleep. Lost in the desert, the woman of water dreams. Obon, vigils, Hanukkah. I've learned we used to be healers. I've learned we used to be beloved. Vigils, birthdays, vigils. Don't know what else I've learned, except we know a lot of dead people. Candles, more candles, more candles, more. Be yourself, sure. Festoon yourself in sideshow sequins, thrift store sex. The world comes and vomits and locks the children away. The sales clerk is watching you. Your hometown is not your hometown. Live without apology, sure. Have your life debated by experts you'll never meet, cast out by Ohana you never knew. Ask who hides from family, what women from the D that the S triggers long after the T should be P. Ask who can visit the supermarket for orange juice and salad dressing and paper towels. Maybe tomorrow will be different, but today, ask why you were born today. Ask what is good, bad. Ask how eternal truths should rest so much upon today. My mother stirs her pot of spare ribs with brown sugar and soy sauce and vinegar and regret for a son who wasted his life for God knows what. No future, no wedding, not even a home. Steam rises from the stock pot like the stories of Spice's songs and all the home that this girl will never know. From parents who call gay people it, hearsays immigrants and AIDS would disown their firstborn if they only knew what sins their sins had spawned that I could tell her how I stir my verse with Lahaina girl rhythm, how in my kitchen, she would know every pot and pan and spice. The flesh grows tender, the flavors burn, waiting for that moment just before it binds, just before I leave, just before another trans woman obliterated on a Facebook page or down the street, or just before my mother's eyes. Who loved, who bled, who recorded the first words I said? Who read to, care, to shut my careless eyes? Who said before they realized that I could one day be dead to them, their world, their prayers, that they'd be with me no matter where I went? Where was that message sent? For I'm not the same person I was then and I will never return to that there and then, no matter how I may or may not try. Release, remember, goodbye. Consider the irrational array of moments where a single rational value does not resolve. The cat survives, the moon recedes. The sashimi is disgusting, trendy, delicious, endangered. People die for what I am. People insist what I am has no meaning at all. Waiting by the windowsill with laptop, a cup of coffee and a donut. To be yourself, you seed yourself to the butterflies to the baryons, 
into the wind and no one to answer tranquility. And so that's from this Uncommon Stars. So this one here, this is, you know, why dust shall never settle upon the soul. And then suddenly I have this novel that I have been, I, I'm writing and um, this novel, it, it's kind of hard to write a science. I mean, trust me, after reading this, this is going to be difficult because suddenly we're in space talking about donuts. Um, and, uh, but um, I think to some of the people in, in who were reading science fiction, as I was talking about in, my, in the master class, um, people have expectations of what science fiction should be. And one of the things that I did was I tried to bring people I knew into the story. And people were kind of wondering, you know, um, reviewers are saying, why did you go? Why did you talk about sex work? Why did you talk about uh, violence? Why did you talk about this stuff? Well, because that's where the people I'm trying to pick up and take the stars live. And I'm going to they, they, they've done enough. I'm going to try to meet readers that I love, that I want to bring, that I want to include where they are. And so um, this is the first. So I'm going to read a few. I'm going to introduce you to three characters here. And then I'm going to, I want to talk, you know, because I want to also go over one of the places I write about music. And then I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, the, the problem with write, reading from a novel that's been released and it's still on sale and all of that is I don't want to spoil too many things. So I can't like read some of the parts that I love the most. So you're just going to have to trust me um, that um, I don't even know. It, it's trust everybody around you. If they think it's a good book, trust them because I can't really say that about my own work. So whatever, you know, just here it is. Anyway, this is called Light from, this is uh, Light from Uncommon Stars. And uh, one of the characters is, is named Katrina, and she's a trans runaway. Um, quick backstory, the reason that uh, the character is named Katrina is a long time ago, I had a friend named Katrina, and uh, she was crying because every time she brought up, her name was Katrina, people mentioned the hurricane, and she was a gentle soul, and she thought, uh, so, I, you know, she just, I don't like being associated with that. So I told her, don't worry, Katrina. One of these days, I'm going to write a novel. I'm going to name the main character Katrina, and I'll some, have something else to talk about. And so that's why this book is dedicated to Katrina and all Katrinas. So. It hurt. Yes, it hurt. It was definitely not a bruise. Yes, she was scared. Her throat was raw from screaming. Cautiously, Katrina Wen felt under her bed. Girl clothes, boy clothes, money, birth certificate, social security card, toothbrush, spare glasses, backup battery, makeup, estradiol, spironolactone. Katrina had made an escape bag the first time her father had threatened to kill her. At first, the bag had seemed like an in-case of emergency, a glass that one would never break. But after tonight, why had she let it come to this? Why couldn't she be what her parents wanted? Part of her was in a panic. What have you done? Apologize. Knock on their door right now. Say it's your fault. Say you're sorry. Say you'll promise to change. But another part, stronger, of Katrina was calm even cold. You have to escape tonight. Breathe, be quiet, listen. And so Katrina listened for footsteps, for breathing, for sleep. She listened and listened. Through the dark, she heard her mother's one last cough, her father's one last flush. And then Finally, there was silence. Katrina clutched her ribs, then propped herself up. The pain was sharp, but manageable. 
She was in her room behind a locked door. All she needed to do was be quiet and calm. She could do this. Mm. She could do this. By the light of her phone, Katrina applied concealer around her eye and to her cheek. It would be better not to face the world with visible bruises. Then she placed a note on her bed. In it, she had written that she was sorry, that she'd wish she'd never been born, that she didn't want to make them angry and that she'd never bother them again. And that was all true. But then she wrote she was going to San Francisco. There'd be no reason to doubt her. Of course she'd go there. That's where the queers went. Her father would punch the wall, throw something heavy and breakable. Her mother would cross herself and utter, utter a prayer. And in a day or two, her mother would call Tia Claudia across the bay to find their stupid son and send them home. By that time, though, she'd be over 400 miles away. Silently, Katrina put on her coat. She slid open her bedroom window. Outside, there was noise from a police helicopter, noise from some family next door. There was noise from the highway, from nice cars leaving and less nice ones coming home. Yet Katrina moved steadily, almost gracefully, as she gathered what she needed, ticket, Laptop, escape bag, violin. Then Katrina crawled atop her desk and dropped to the ground. Mercifully, adrenaline overrode her pain. She reached up, slid the window closed, and looked at her phone. Good, there was still time. As quickly as she could, Katrina limped past her neighbors, the highway, the cars, police helicopters overhead. She'd catch Bart to Oakland, then find somewhere to wait out the night. In the morning, she would get on a big white bus to Los Angeles. Now, those of you who have never ridden an Asian bus, big white Asian bus, probably never will. You see, they don't load at a Greyhound terminal uh, or bus depots or train stations. Instead, one catches them at an Asian shopping center or supermarket. Some are Vietnamese, a few are Korean, many are Chinese. Some go to Las Vegas, others shuttle to the casinos of Morongo, Pechanga, and San Miguel. Yet another subset runs along a network of Asian communities throughout the state. There's Oakland Chinatown and San Francisco Chinatown, Little Saigon and San Diego Chinatown. And of course, fleets of them converge in the San Gabriel Valley, Rosemead, San Gabriel, Monterey Park, and the rest of the Asian American Holy Land. I think, girl, uh, the woman said. She didn't bother whispering. So what if the kid could hear? They were speaking Cantonese. The young ones are either Americanized or speaking Mandarin. Not girl, the other one insisted. Too ugly to be girl. But she's wearing makeup. There was silence. Too ugly to be girl, she finally agreed. Definitely boy. To be girl would be sad. Mm, sad. These women were about her mother's age. They could have been her mother's friends. She didn't need to understand them to understand them, for it blended with the chatter that she heard every day. Katrina didn't try to block their words. She'd given up on that a long time ago. Instead, Katrina leaned her head against the window and listened to the voices of the women, the drone of the engine, the roar of a passing truck. She listened to the pain in her ribs, the throbbing, keeping time with each swerve and bump in the road. It was all music. Let it all be music. If she could make it music, Katrina knew, there would eventually be a rest and a place she could breathe. She cradled her violin. She heard a melody. Finally, Katrina went let herself sleep. And so that's Katrina. And Katrina is escaping. And I wanted to pick her up right away. The next character and the next character in this book is Shizuka Satomi. Now Shizuka is the closest thing people ask about Shizuka and uh, Shizuka is the closest to me when I think about it. Um, I, I, uh, I relate to most of my world as a teacher and um, I've made my mistakes both as a teacher and as a woman. Uh, and yet sometimes I find myself driven to create things that uh, 
well, I still do. And that maybe not with a violin, maybe with a pen, but, um, and sometimes I feel maybe my work in some senses redeems me. Six times Shizuka Satomi had created brilliance. Six times she had taken an aspiring musician, trained them, formed them, and created a star. Even more incredible, while most teachers seem to cultivate a characteristic sound or style, Satomi students were it turns icy, devastating, blinding, delicate, frenetic, breathtakingly sensual. Her success, her touch, the effortless, almost inevitable way she pulled genius after genius from thin air was uncanny, almost supernatural. Little wonder then that people began to call her the queen of hell. However, it had been over a decade since she had taken on a new student. Why? Well, some believe she was the victim of a shattered heart. Before his death, Satomi's last student, Yi Feng Brian Zhang, had been seen with her in honesty, laughing over hot chocolate. The dashing young violinist had thanked her from every stage he played. And in a television interview, he claimed that was only after studying with Shizuka Satomi that he knew the true meaning of love. Perhaps they'd been more than teacher and student. Others surmised that the reason was more mundane, that she might simply have retired. The Queen of Hell had taught Yi Feng Zhang, who followed Kiana Choi, who followed Sabrina Eisen, and so on, and so on, and so on. And even if she found another, what would be left to accomplish? Whatever the reason, with each passing year, more people assumed that the Queen of Hell had no intention of ever teaching again. Idiots! <laughs> For 10 years, Shizuka Satomi had been researching and searching and searching from Lausanne to Salzburg to Sydney, most recently to Tokyo. She had listened and searched prospect after prospect, nothing, nothing, nothing. Not that they didn't try. Mm. Not that musicians hadn't traveled to her, offered her everything they had, all they could imagine, <laughs> as if all they could imagine would be close enough. Others around her, including Tremont Philippe himself, had suggested that she was being too selective, perhaps even arbitrary. Surely, over the past 10 years, she had found musicians who might be appropriate. appropriate. Of course she had. Her previous six students had been an almost uninterrupted string of genius. All of them had been perfectly appropriate, yet each one, with each one, Shizuka became more and more aware that something was wrong. No, that something was missing. As she watched each of them shine and fall and sparkle and burn, Shizuka became more and more obsessed with the music playing just beyond hearing, maddeningly familiar, yet always beyond her grasp until finally in Tokyo, she heard it. Through the din of 13 million people and vending machines and ramen joints and internet cafes and electric trains and cherry blossoms for each of them twice over, coming not from within that city, but far across the sea, coming from all places, home. Shizuka swerved past a very slow Lexus, then accelerated onto Huntington Drive. The San Gabriel Valley resembled an Asian American monopoly board. Cambodians, Chinese, Vietnamese, Laotians, Vietnamese, Chinese, a few Koreans, even some Japanese crisscrossed past the working class neighborhoods of Rosemead, Monterey Park, El Monte, through middle class Temple City, San Gabriel, and Alhambra, all the way up to Boardwalk in Park Place, San Marino, and to Arcadia, where Shizuka was arriving now. She could feel herself breathing faster as she passed the Santa Anita Plaza, a gilded shopping mall where one might procure truffle-filled dumplings, a Hello Kitty latte, and a $2,000 box of Chinese bird's nest. Quickly, she sped by the Santa Anita racetrack, home to the fashionable 626 night market, drawing Asians of all persuasions of a night of stinky tofu, boba, taro macaroons, and international indie film screenings, until finally she arrived at her destination, Xinhua Phoenix Hall. Xinhua Phoenix Hall was actually the smaller of two buildings designed by the renowned architect An Wei. Across the courtyard, still shrouded 
in construction covers was the site of Xinhua Phoenix Investment Bank's grand frozen golden friendship pavilion due to open the following year. Between them was a massive fountain in the shape of an ever-flowing teapot and inscribed in its side was a carved and gilded symbol for eternity. It had seemed like an eternity since Shizuka so anticipated a performance. She didn't know exactly how she knew, but she knew. And when Tremon Philippe mentioned the Grohl girl, that was confirmation enough. By now, she could feel it almost physically pulling her. A timeless music that her other students, for all their genius, had only been able to trace. Shizuka Satomi took a deep breath. There was no need to hurry. The Queen of Hell did not hurry. She checked her makeup one last time, then put on her sunglasses. Here would be her last and seventh student. Here would be her last and seventh soul. And then what would be left to accomplish? Everything. I'm looking at the time right now and speaking of everything, I think I've taken up almost the entire hour and I'm really, really happy. So you're gonna have to read to learn about the donut lady. Uh, but with that all being said, uh, are there any questions or any comments or anything like that? Thank you for writing about the go bag. Oh. <laughs> that made me cry a little. Oh. Um, and I also really appreciated your poem. And I was wondering if you could continue to be so vulnerable um, and talk about bravery is an overused word, but the, the vulnerability of writing the line, you know, she killed herself the way that queer people do. Um, and where you find the confidence to like read that at a reading. You, literally, <laughs> I found out that I've been, maybe I've been lucky, but I found that when I've been truthful, people respond and answer with their own truth. Uh, maybe when I first was re writing poetry about transitioning and and transphobia and all these other things, it was scary. It feels like doing a stage dive. But um, maybe this is something that we have as queer, maybe this is part of the magic that trans and queer people are supposed to have. But I found that when I talk about myself and I make myself vulnerable, I'm usually rewarded. And so literally you, you give me strength. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Um, thank you for writing um, about the trans runaway teens because I was almost one of them. Um, I, I am not an English major. I'm a psychology major. For, so coming to this is like exciting and I love your writing. It's so Thank lovely you. and so passionate and so vulnerable. It makes me want to cry. Um, thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for reading. Thank you so much. You know, it's, it's really, it's, it's, we're breaking new ground uh, with this book. And I think, you know, we're, we have to be really, really careful as, as trans, as trans folk, because it's this really interesting thing. A lot of times I think we're endangered by our own brilliance. We, whenever we have the chance to shine, we do. And when we do, it freaks people out and they want to take, and they want to hurt us. Um, so whenever there are times to, you know, right now, Shelley Parker Chan is uh, also nominated for uh, Hugo and Shelley Parker Chan, you know, Shelley's good piece, Shelley's another friend of mine. And, you know, she, you know, uh, gender, gender queer, I'm trans there, you know, when these things happen, well, there's going to be pushback. Uh, even right now, I want to tell people if you for those of you listening, if you like books, if you like what I do, um, and you want to see more of the same, don't make it where trans people have to hide who they are. You know, that, that's counterproductive. 
So, um, you know, you, you want trans people writing stories and things much more than, you know, dying. I mean, it causes a mess. Don't, wouldn't you just rather read a story? Uh, we're not hurting anybody. And we're, we're just trying to go about our lives. You know, I mean, it's like, what? I mean, about the worst thing that's going to happen for me is I'm ahead of you at line Starbucks, okay, because I want my coffee. But I mean, I don't think that necessitates you say, you know, not you, but you know, transphobic people saying such horrible things. Um, so maybe in some ways, too, I mean, you know, when, when I'm writing about these things, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm wondering, do, do straight cisgender people have to worry about writing a good story and being killed? I, I don't know. I don't even know if this happens. All I know is the higher my profile, the more I've got to be careful. I've been very, very lucky, knock wood, but I'm worried. You know, part of me is worried that, you know, I'm, as I become more uh, visible, um, yeah. Cool. Anybody else want to chat? Thank you very much for that. And good luck with your studies, by the way. Everybody's good luck, but good luck with that. I'm teaching psychological criticism in my theory class, and I just tell them, look, I'm not a psych major. We're doing very meatball stuff, but you know, and don't try this on people around you. <laughs> uh, anybody else want to chit chat or share? I mean, it's we're supposed to be for an hour, but you know, if you want to go for another five minutes, I'll answer a couple more questions. I'm at your disposal. The main thing is I want you to uh, gain something from this. Rika, I, I would just love, first of all, thank you so much. This has been beautiful. Um, I, I just wanted to ask uh, a question <clears throat> about kind of your local experience here and like, you know, what, what your time in Ithaca, uh, yeah, you did freeze a little bit, but mm. you're, you're coming back to us. Mm. Um, <laughs> could, you repeat, could you repeat that because yeah, of something uh, I, just, I, I was just kind of curious about you know whatever place uh whether good or bad the this the finger lakes ithaca kind of holds in your heart and and you know what you took from this place well um two things from ithaca actually three uh i really enjoyed my time in ithaca because this was literally the, in Ithaca was the first time I, I ran into people, one on the East Coast, two, I ran into so many white people because I literally did grow up in the San Gabriel Valley and in Hawaii, and I was scared. I, I was frightened. I, I thought, oh my gosh, what the heck did I, I get into? I was more scared of white people than I was of February, okay? That's how scared I was here, you know, coming in here, but uh I found out that uh, you find the strangest allies and that, you know, you can find friends and chosen family uh, everywhere. One of my, uh, my, one, you know, the teachers who changed my life the most at Cornell were Southern white men. Um, you know, Archie Ammons was really a huge influence in my in my life he, he he always said you know i would visit cornell afterwards coming back and you would say you know welcome home and i go why do you keep saying home because why well, you was born here this is where you became a poet <laughs> you know and, and okay thank you archie uh but archie also told me this really interesting thing he said you know he said two things actually one is never be afraid to empty yourself completely into your art because if you empty yourself, your art will refill. And the second one was, if you can help the human condition, even a little bit with your work, you're going to be rewarded beyond your wildest dreams. And that's exactly what's happened. I guess I must have helped somebody because I'm feeling damn rewarded right now. Uh, coming to Ithaca for a person of color is like somebody who's white going into a place, you know, where there's, it's not, it's, it was an education. Um, I'm going to be back in Ithaca, I'm hoping in November. Uh, I won the, uh, which award? I, I, 
for excellence in publishing, uh, the, the MFA program is inviting me back. I'll, if you don't mind, I'll send you a note over when that happens. Uh, it's ironic because I'm uh, getting it for science fiction when I came out of the, the, the poetry program. But um, Ithaca, for all of its kind of like, you know, white liberal faults, there's also a lot of white liberal derpy coolness too. And uh, I think that coming in as a graduate student was really good for me because I think I had the maturity to let the microaggressions kind of pass me and make me realize why I'm here and gain the most of it. Uh, but I think for students who are students of color, or students who come from cities or students who come from those things, the, the, the more counseling and the more uh, education and, and, and the more friendly teachers around, and they don't have to be people of color, they can just you know, they don't, you don't have to understand what you don't understand, but sharing your wisdom and sharing uh, your perspective and, and, and teaching and, and all that, I think is just invaluable. I hope that I, I was a really roundabout way of answering it, but my feelings towards Cornell is uh, I left an abusive home to come to Cornell and uh, all of this stuff comes from Ithaca too. I really, I really, uh, Love the Finger Lakes area. Plus, like I said, amazing sunsets. Thank you so much, Rika. Um, You're so welcome. I, I hope that you consider Wells part of your chosen family too, because it's been wonderful having you here. I would. I'm. I'm so honored. Ah, uh, you just. You're doing such great things there, and you know, just Wells being a smaller liberal arts school. Uh, it's not always the easiest task to, to teach and to associate, to come to Wells is in some ways a political act, in many ways a political act, and I applaud you for it. Um, you know, no one's going to worry, you know, it's like nobody's going to ever doubt that, you know, Cornell is there because it's got all that Ivy League thing going on. But Wells is a really, really special place, even coming from the, even coming from the Ithaca side of things. I just want to applaud the wonderful community that you have there in Aurora. Thank you so much. I don't know how to add to that. It's, <laughs> it's beautiful. Uh, I, I just would like to, um, uh, we've got some, some love going on in the chat. Um, <laughs> uh, I just want to, first of all, just thank you uh, Rika so much for your time and all your what you shared with us to, today was really beautiful and again thank you to the program in uh, in women's transgender and queer studies and and for your co-sponsoring this event um, I will just plug really quickly that we have one final writer uh, in the Wells visiting writer series the poet Jaswinder Bolina uh, will be here next week and in person um, so We'll close out our series with that, um, but it's going to be very difficult to top Rika Aoki. I think that's this has been a beautiful, beautiful series of events. So thank you, Rika. Thank you so You're much. You're so very welcome. Take care, everyone. All right. Love you all. Bye. Take care.